Hey everyone, we're back. Good to see you after a night off. Uh, it's good to be back on the air. Hope you're all having a great Sunday. We have a lot to get through because we didn't have a show last night. Danny Mitchell is here. He's back. Danny's back from a celebrity endorsement event. Uh, DJ was here too. And Juniper. Show you runs late and Nana Lana. Seems like it's a quiet chat tonight. Where is everyone? Everyone's sleeping. Everyone got knocked out in the electrical geomagnetic storm that's going on. Is that what happened? Hold on. Let me show you something. Have you all seen this? Where is it? Apparently there is a geomagnetic storm going on right now. If I can find it, I will show you. It is apparently affecting the United States right now. Okay. Apparently it's not showing up on my thing. What the hell? Um, <laughs> it's like it's disappeared. It's like it's magic. Hold on. Oh, there we go. So apparently there is a, a level four uh, geomagnetic storm levels. Apparently it could get so severe that the aurora in America could be seen as far south as like Northern California uh, across all Northern states in America. Here it says, uh, G1 through G4 levels have been reached so far with this CME related activity. And sh should G4 levels be reached tonight, the aurora may be visible over much of the northern half of the country, maybe as far south as Alabama to northern California. So look outside tonight and see if you're um, see if you can see the aurora out there. I don't know. It may it may DJ. It may. I have no idea. Tornado is about to go through the Texas Oklahoma. A nighttime tornado? I didn't see one. Let's have a look. While we while we get everyone here, let's have a quick look. Let's have a look on the SPC. Oh, that is a pretty cool day. That's always a five percent risk. What does it say? There is something going on. Um, it says there is, in Kansas, damage to roofs, power lines, and fences, possible tornado damage in the Wilson Addition area. Uh, another tornado reported in Grove, Kansas, or Gove. Second tornado, tornado developed west of the first one. Wow. So they're having it near County Road BB east of Oakley. So apparently there's a few tornadoes in, looks like mostly Kansas. It looks like um, it went up the Texas line. I'll show you here. It went up sort of the panhandle of Texas, skipped the little handle in um, Oklahoma, and then kind of kept going in in uh, Kansas right now. So there's a few storms out there. Hope everyone keeps safe. Oh, he was out earlier. I didn't see. I've been getting ready for the show. Uh, yeah, we're not too far away from tornado season. Pretty close, if not now. Leisha says it was 66 degrees yesterday. Oh my God. It's getting cooler here, actually. It's getting cooler. Um, okay. So keep an eye out for tornadoes and geomagnetic <laughs> storms, apparently. Apparently the US is also having a a solar blackout in, in like, a, like a week or something, and it could affect the power in Texas, I was learning today. Could affect power in Texas while it happens. Yeah, our summer is ending. We're heading into um, into winter right now. It's starting to get a bit cooler every day. And in about a month or two, we'll be freezing every moment. So 
we're heading out next weekend. Our daylight savings finishes for the uh, for the year. All right, let me get on to our first. Our first, uh, sh- sh- what is it? Story for tonight? Okay. So it says, TV show to spotlight 1990 Alcoa Unsolved Murder. So this was the uh, episode of Cold Justice on Saturday night. I wasn't here, so I'll explain why I wasn't here. Um, Our family is traveling to Europe next week, which means we're not having Easter. So we had Easter this weekend. So we did our Easter celebration yesterday. And um, I totally forgot about it. And I was... I originally thought we we're doing it at night, and I was like, yeah, I can still do the show, and then they were like, no, no, it's at one o'clock, and I'm like, ah, damn, uh, and uh, yeah, so I end up having to do that, but that means next weekend for Easter long weekend, you have me every day, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, Easter Saturday, I'll be on every night, because we're not doing anything, so you'll have me for the entire holiday. So there's your little explanation of what happened yesterday. Uh, the other thing that happened is uh, our car broke down at at like 11 o'clock at night and we were stuck in a friggin' car park for five hours until uh, roadside assistance could come and fix the car and get us out of there. <laughs> they charge a fortune too. End up having a, a, a cell die in the battery so it wasn't producing enough uh, voltage to get the car started. It was producing like 11 volts or something and not 12 volts. And then the other thing that happened is our crankshaft sensor died at like almost the same time and that had to be replaced. And it was lucky the guy who came out actually had one in his like in his roadside repair thing. <clears throat> so we were able to get it done, but it took an hour or two to get to get it done so yep that was my saturday night so that was a a fun time so that that's what happened over the weekend so i did that and then i came home crash woke up and then i had to go to easter so that's why there was no show the other night uh all right let's get back to the true crime it says here an episode of the tv show cold justice will feature an unsolved murder that happened in alcoa in 1990 the episode is centered around the unsolved murder of 80-year-old Emmeline Croft. The Alcoa Police Department Criminal Investigations Division partnered with host Kelly Siegler and her team for the episode. Now, we're going to go a bit deeper into the episode. I'm going to show you a few things. We're going to talk about it. It's a really sad case of like an 80-year-old woman who was murdered in her home and sexually assaulted. And in a bit of a bizarre way, we're going to talk about it. But first, we're going to watch the news clip because this is really cool um, that it was on like local TV for some people in Tennessee. You might have seen it on the nightly news if you were watching. So let's see. One more thing. Alcoa police diving into the world of true crime television. The department telling us it will be featured this weekend on the show Cold Justice, which airs on the Oxygen Channel. The episode focuses on a cold case from 1990, the killing of Emmeline Croft. They're still hoping to get answers and still taking tips at 865-981-4111. Cold Justice airs at 9 p.m. Saturday. Again, this is on the Oxygen channel, but you'll also be able to stream it on Hulu and on YouTube. Hopefully it'll help. Hope so. Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Bit of a, that was their, new, their little news clip for the uh, show last week. It says here, the Alcoa police shared in a post on Facebook that the CID, Knoxville police hey, and the, med- the CID is hoping that there'll be an increase in anonymous tips and reports from the show that will help solve the case. In December 1990, Croft was found R-worded and stabbed to death in her home on Garfield Street, but it was unclear what the motive behind the stabbing was. In February 2005, Alcoa police shared that the case was reopened after more than 14 years with the hope new technology would help identify a suspect in the case. Croft said uh, Croft was said to be extremely a well-liked woman in the community who was kind and never met a stranger. It said the episode of Cold Justice will air on Saturday, 23rd of March on the Oxygen Channel. 
and will be available to stream wherever you can stream it. Uh, yeah, that's. I just wanted to show this because people in Tennessee might get a, a kick out of that being on your local news, ABC6, W-A-T-E. And then we'll switch to the oxygen. It says, cold justice seeks public help in solving brutal 1990, you know, this word, and then murder of 80-year-old woman. So we're going we're gonna to break it down a little bit. Um, I won't give you the, well, there is no, I hate to tell you this, but the fact that they're still calling for help should be a pretty, pretty big indicator as to how the episode went. Um, the fact that it's not like, yeah, we arrested like 40 people and they're all in jail and facing murder charges. Yeah, we won. High five. Yeah, so it should tell you what happened. The, the fact they're saying, calling on the public's help for more tips, that is a bit of a hint. Uh, it says here, Kelly Siegler and Cold Justice head to Tennessee to learn more about the, you know, brutal sexual assault and murder of a beloved 80-year-old woman. The cold case prosecutor and homicide investigator Tonya Ryder joined officials with the Alcoa Police Department, including Detective Woody Hughes and Lieutenant Doug Sparks, to find out who killed em uh, Emmeline Croft in her home. Retired Sergeant Ron Schroeder of the Kissimmee, hey, we know Kissimmee, Kissimmee Police Department in Florida is also assisting in the investigation after moving to the area. That's pretty cool that he retired and then moved to a different area and they took him on to help with cold cases so the, unfortunately this woman emmeline was found in her home her her underwear her they call it on the show panties i hate that word uh were missing her gown was destroyed sort of like shredded by someone pulling on it and um she was stabbed in her throat on either side of where your veins are here. Uh, that, you know, they feed oxygen and blood to your brain. If you cut these, you die. And she was stabbed both on both sides. And one went all the way back to her, her uh, neck right into the bone. And they said they were very deep cuts. Not only that, but she had suffered at some point either during the assault or after a very brutal sexual assault which by the way trigger warning uh which included a fork yes i'm not joking i did say that right it wasn't it it wasn't like you know some sort of innuendo or something like that actually a fork the fork was also used to stab her a couple of times in the face but it was used to assault her lady regions uh she yeah she had suffered a very brutal and they were they were saying in the show like who could do this to an 80 year old woman a couple of the suspects are actually relatives of hers both grandchildren but the family believes at least one of them couldn't do that because the grandmother had always been really kind to this one grandson and he was an addict but she was the one that kept her door open for him it doesn't matter how bad things got for him. She was always the one that supported him, always allowed him in her home. If no one else would let him in, she would, and um, always gave him a, a, a bed to sleep in and a hot meal, and she always took care of him. And the family just don't believe, no matter how, ba how bad things got for him, that, that he would kill her. They said he might kill someone, but he would never do the sexual assault. He wouldn't. He just wasn't that type of guy. And um, they don't believe it was him. But there is a second grandson. He was only 16 at the time of the murder. And afterwards, he went on a bit of a rampage assaulting women. And they are concerned because one of his, one of his arrests was because he had been stalking and breaking into another woman's property and he had stolen her nighties and her underwear they were like oh that's a bit you know it's a bit coincidental that grandma's missing her undies and you know this guy is stealing underwear from a woman that he was tr apparently they weren't even going out 
the woman's like, I didn't even date the guy. He just started stalking me from my work. I work at the Hilton. He came in one day and he just started harassing me. So they actually cornered him during a, uh, he was on parole. He had to come in for a, you know, parole meeting. And apparently part of the parole conditions are that you have to be helpful to any investigation that comes, you know, that comes up. You have to be truthful. You have to try, I guess, give as much evidence as you can. Uh, and when they brought him in, he tried to downplay every event that happened. So he was involved in a uh, sexual assault on a stripper in Texas. Uh, they were in a park together. He went too far with her and she was, you know, saying no. He tried to downplay that by saying, oh, you know, she just didn't want to get in trouble with the cops for being in a closed park at night. And they just kind of looked at each other and went, so she yells out the R word to get out of a $20 ticket for being in a park. And they're like, that doesn't really make much sense. Then they brought up the woman that he was harassing um, and stealing her underwear. And he tried to downplay that too by saying she makes up stories and exaggerates them. So they didn't really believe that either. That's really unfortunate. But uh, they said he could have answered those questions in a number of ways that would have taken a lot of suspicion of him. You know, he said, you know, I, I had a, after grandma died, I, I had a hard time dealing with it. I lashed out against other women you know, I've learned my lesson, you know, I don't do that anymore. Like he could have said anything like that, but instead he just kind of made it seem like the women were the problem instead of him. And they really didn't like that. Apparently when he left the parole office, his parole officer asked him, are you under suspicion for that? What they were talking to you about? And he told his parole officer, oh no, they're not looking at me. Yet they deliberately told him in the meeting, that they were looking at him for the murder of his grandmother. So he even lied to his parole officer after they got out of the meeting. So he's a bit of a weird dude. Uh, I'll read you a little bit here. So I've told you a, bit, a little bit about the suspects. There was a neighbor too they thought could have been involved, but apparently they were good friends with um with the woman, but he had a wife who was dying at the time. She had a uh, terminal condition and uh she became friends with with both of them and sort of comforted comforted him while his wife was dying they don't believe anything happened it's just sort of like she was being a very good neighbor and uh some people thought maybe they were having an affair he killed her because of the wife or something but it never it never got there and apparently it's just there's no no evidence to continue on that one uh, so I've told you a little bit about the uh, three three suspects, two grandchildren and a neighbor. So I'm going to read you a little bit here about a little bit about here, about what, what condition she was found in. It says, in December 8th, 1990, Croft was found on a sofa of her Alcoa, Tennessee home, less than 20 miles south of Knoxville. It was an incredibly violent scene puzzling authority since Croft, who had five children and four grandsons, wasn't known to have any enemies. The nightgown she was wearing was ripped. There were two pieces of nightgown lying on the floor in front of the couch. She had blunt force trauma to the head, and she'd been stabbed in the neck several times, and then had puncture and scrape marks about her face and torso area. They think this was done with the uh, fork, possibly. A bent fork, possibly used to inflict puncture wounds to the body, was also found near the sofa, and a large kitchen knife was discovered in the hallway. Making the crime even more grisly was that whoever killed Croft also vaginally and anally sexually assaulted her. However, it was unclear if the victim was uh, penetrated by a sexual intercourse or with a foreign object. Authorities noted no signs of forced entry and they had little physical evidence to work with. They said the strange thing is this was such a violent crime, but there are no viable fingerprints. There was no semen left behind and all the DNA testing came up empty. So they basically have no evidence of whoever was in there and whoever committed the killing. 
It says the suspects, the team of investigators, looked into theories of a random attacker, possibly someone influenced by drugs. So there is one other theory. The grandson I told you about, the addict, he used to run with some very, very nasty people. And they actually knew that he stayed at his grandmother's house quite frequently when other family wouldn't let him in. They said they can't discount that maybe possibly someone he had upset or owed money to came to the grandmother's house to get revenge uh, and they knew by attacking the grandmother it could have been a way to get to him and then they have no way of ruling it out because they're not sure. They said detectives said unsubstantiated rumors swelled that Croft and Norfleet were rent romantically involved. That's the neighbor. At the time of the murder, Norfleet's wife was terminally ill and he was her primary caregiver. Yeah, they found that that was nothing there, unfortunately. They said Norfleet's wife died of natural causes not long after Croft's homicide. They said next, the team looked at uh, two of Croft's grandsons, both of whom found themselves on, on investigators' radar. First was Dennis Kimsey, no longer living, who frequently spent time with Croft and had a long history of substance abuse. Other crimes listed on his rap sheet include driving under the influence, vandalism, assault with an automobile, and aggravated burglary. The assault with the automobile was when he actually tried to run over two cops who had stopped him on the side of the road. He tried to ram them with his car. There's a, uh, there's a photo of Emily Croft, really a uh, lovely lady. Says here, one witness claimed they even saw Dennis once raise a hand to Croft when Croft refused to hand over money for drugs. Investigators also looked into a second grandson, Darren Etheridge. He's the one we were talking about. He's the one that they uh, went to his parole office, who was only 16 at the time of Croft's homicide and not previously considered a suspect. His whole family didn't think he was a suspect. <clears throat> His family were like, oh, he was too small and too young to do this. And in the interview with investigators, he even said to them, oh, no one thinks I did this. And I was like, wow, that's a really strange thing to, to say to someone. Why would you say that to investigators? Oh, I, I'm not being investigated or no one thinks I did this crime. That's like a red flag, like, like you know that you're never going to be investigated. That's a weird thing to say. Uh, let me see. I want to want to see what I'm. A, a distinguished gentleman outside. Well, you don't leave him out there too long. <laughs> don't leave him out there too long. He might freeze to death. Uh, it says here, Etheridge, which is the uh, who was 16 at the time of the murder, had been charged with five unrelated stalking incidents, among other things. In 2000, he's arrested in Texas. He picks up a stripper and then they decide to go off on their own to a park and then things go bad. Etheridge, then 26, was accused of uh, R-wording the exotic dan dancer before police caught them in the act. In response, the suspect allegedly attempted to assault the officer with the car as he tried to flee. Seems to be a thing running in the family, assaulting officers with cars. Uh, here it says they take a fresh look at the case. Uh... Tim Kimsley, uh, Kimsey, the brother uh, of the now deceased, now deceased uh, Dennis or Denny, he said that uh, my brother was a criminal. He did a lot of bad things in his life. There's nothing he wouldn't do. No matter who it was, they have to be brought to justice. Um, but I think one of the other brothers also said that he just, he may have been that bad of a guy, but he wouldn't have hurt his grandma that he loved so much. And it says here, apparently a lot of the relatives are Croft's grandchildren, Danny, da Davida, and sisters Lori and Amanda, had all wondered if Denny was involved in the violent death. But for most, the brutality and the sexual assault of the 80-year-old woman seemed beyond, uh, beyond comprehension. In fact, loved ones said that despite Denny's drug use and his brushes with the law, he and Croft had a loving relationship. Uh, they said, walk in there, get mad, and accidentally kill her. Hands down, I could totally see that. But to carry through with the sexual stuff, I find that very hard to believe. 
And that's what the uh, family was saying that, yeah, he might kill someone, but he wouldn't have done that uh, gross sexual stuff to his grandma. Uh, then they're wondering if it was one of his drug related associates. And that's one of the lines of inquiry that they have been unable to um, like extinguish from the investigation. They just can't rule it out. And that makes it harder when they were trying to investigate Darren Etheridge because they're, they're saying, how do you rule Darren out when he has these, uh, you know, stalking and sexual assaults of other women, but then we can't rule out a random intruder or someone who knew Denny either. So a complicated investigation, unfortunately. The team was... Um, very upset by the end of the episode that they'd spent o over a week working solely on this case, re-interviewing everyone they could, flying to different states to interview different uh, people important to the investigation, and they basically came up with not much. And they were very disappointed because they said, this 80-year-old woman deserves to have justice and, you know, someone has to do time for what they did to her you know they murdered and brutalized an 80 year old woman that was kind to everyone helped everyone and um yeah they were they were saying like why won't the uh, gods of homicide let them solve the case and they were unable to uh come up with anything substantial except for the danny etheridge uh information they said that they will they can't rule him out and they will definitely keep investigating him as some of his stuff it just it's the missing panties from the girl he was uh harassing they said that's very odd that he stole that from that girl and the grandmother's underwear was missing too but it says here when asked about the younger darren etheridge loved ones didn't seem to have considered him a suspect Especially, especially given his age and small size at the time, they also claim Croft was as strong as, as the grandmother was as strong as an ox, and didn't believe someone as small as Darren could overtake the woman. So at the time when he was sixteen, he was a very small guy and very uh, weak. They didn't think he was strong enough to overtake that woman, uh, murder her, and brutalize her. They just said, you know, he was too little. But uh, it is interesting that he went on to develop a lot of issues pertaining to women and violence. It is, a, it is a connection that you can't ignore. And I'm going to try find some more stuff here. Yeah, just as they, they interviewed uh, other family members and that one of the brothers said, that Dennis, one of the people they thought may be involved in the murder, actually had taken an active role into investigating his grandmother's murder. And before he died, he had actually asked around and tried to investigate on his own, trying to pull theories together about who could have hurt his grandma. And the um, the investigators thought that was a a plus in his column because someone who commits a crime doesn't want people to investigate it because they'll catch them but the fact that he was talking to relatives about how to get how to uh, find the person who did that to the grandma who did it how did it happen and they thought that was uh, an interesting bit of information from one of the relatives uh, it says here yes yeah, so they actually went and interviewed the woman the woman who accused Darren Etheridge of stalking her the woman claimed she met Etheridge while working at a hotel and regularly basically told him no when when he would ask her out. Some of the disturbing statements included that he wanted to F the woman and wanted it rough. Etheridge later egged her vehicle and screamed about how much he loved her, claiming that if he couldn't have her, nobody could. The victim states, he followed me home, broke in. This went on. He stole my 90s, my underwear. My night, he told me my nightgown, my nightgown smelled awesome. He had it on his pillow. For investigators, it was a red flag that Etheridge stole the woman's panties since Croft's underwear was missing from the crime scene. So, there you go. 
and I explained here, this is where they, they went to Denton in Texas and they interviewed Etheridge face to face when he was on parole for a DUI. They uh, surprise interviewed him at the parole office. That would have been a um, <laughs> that would have been a shock when he went in to do his weekly parole meeting. There's a whole TV show there waiting for you to interview interview you about your grandmother's murder, and they think that you may have done it. That would have been a fun Tuesday afternoon, I'm sure. It says Etheridge claimed he was at home when he heard Croft had been killed, and went to Croft's residence where police were already on site. <clears throat> he told Siegler and Detective Hughes that it made sense that people con considered uh, Dennis as a suspect since he was the black sheep of the family. He said, you know, I've been in legal trouble. He's been in legal trouble. You know, the first person you would suspect is someone that's been in trouble with the law. Eth Etheridge said he relocated from Tennessee to Texas after he was accused of stalking the unnamed woman who, claimed, who he claimed was an ex-girlfriend. That's an interesting point. The woman claimed they had never dated, not once. She never went out with him. She never accepted a date from him, and he just stalked her from the moment they met. And then in this meeting with investigators, he said that she was an ex-girlfriend and that she was just a bit crazy and uh, tried to say that she made up stories and embellished uh, the facts. So that, you know, doesn't sound great. It says, uh, yeah, something that she that she denied. He added that he wanted to get away from it all and move to Texas and start fresh. Okay. And says, as far as the incident in Texas where police allegedly found him in the act of, you know, R word, Etheridge claimed he and the exotic dancer were drunk and that the sex was consensual. He said police came upon the vehicle because they were in a park uh, because they were parked hours after the park closed, so they were in a, a closed park, which cops often patrol. He said, I didn't do any of that stuff, but I mean, if you feel like you need to investigate me, that's fine. I mean, if you're going to solve it, you're barking up the wrong tree. So they said they weren't impressed with his interview, and they said that his consistent downplaying of anything he was involved with was a red flag to them. Uh, they said they gathered back in Tennessee to review all the evidence and the suspects before them. With nothing tying Thomas Norfleet to the crime, that's a neighbor, they ultimately ruled him out as a suspect in Emily Croft's murder. It also didn't seem, based on multiple family statements, that Dennis Kimsey was capable of committing such a violent act against his grandmother that he dearly loved. It also didn't seem likely that Dennis Kimsey would be so active in the investigation if he had committed the crimes. And it says, although authorities felt confident that they could eliminate Dennis as a suspect, they were still unsure about the possibility of Darren Etheridge being involved with his grandmother's murder at just 16 years old. Siegler said they weren't even close to having enough evidence to file charges. It was still possible that Cross death was a random attack or a crime committed by one of Dennis Kimsey's drug-related associates. They said there's no nice way to put it. We did not get there, Siegler said of the case. We didn't solve the case. We did not get the answers we wanted. We did not get justice for Emmeline or her family. Our authorities have vowed not to give up on the investigation. Uh, Tim Kimsey said he felt relief when he learned that his brother Dennis had been cleared at a, as a suspect and hoped the news could repair his legacy. Um, they're saying cold justice is now hoping the public can help them solve who killed Emily Croft. Anyone with information is urged to contact the Alcoa Police Department at 1-865-981-4111. So there you go. And I have a thing here. Let me find it. Where is it? Here. Here's a photo of em Emily Croft. And this is the uh, tweet I put up uh, yesterday about it. And uh, that's a photo of her they did at the end of the episode. And there's the number. Alcoa Police Department, 865-981-4111. Anyone with information about her death and sexual assault, get in contact with them. Maybe you can help solve a case from 1990 of a grandmother 
who was apparently kind to everyone she had ever met. Flood warning. Hey, retired RN. I hope your weekend has been nice. So there's my review of the episode from Saturday. I'm sorry we didn't do that on Saturday. Now, I left a whole bunch of stuff out because there's people who haven't watched the episode and I didn't want to basically do every tiny bit in there, including the forensic uh, stuff with the doctor. Uh, Dr. Forensic Pathologist, Dr. Catherine Paneri. She's really good. I love seeing her on the show, but I left that out. So you guys can, uh, if you want to watch the episode, can go back and see the forensic uh, profile of what happened to Emmeline. But what a brutal crime to someone who, um, <clears throat> someone who opened her door to family who were, were at their lowest low, you know, they were, at least one of them was an addict, had pissed off every family member they ever had stole from every family member they ever had and she would not close her door on him she would always leave her door open and invite him in for somewhere to sleep somewhere to be safe and with a hot meal and uh, they said that was her enduring legacy was that she was kind to everyone and you know didn't have an enemy in the world so that's why her murder came as such a surprise Oh, I didn't go to this page. What's going on? You you messing with me now, StreamYard? We're only 20 minutes in. You can't do this to me. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. There's another photo of her when she was a bit younger. And I was able to find this. This is her uh, her grave marker. I was able to find it. So it says Emmeline 1910 to 1990. Uh, so she was 80 years old. And Reverend, Rev, 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 what is it? Rev, I can't do it anymore. Uh, Claude T. I'm guessing that must have been her husband. Uh, and he died in 1972, quite a while after, like she died in 1990. I'm guessing that must have been her, her husband. And it says Etheridge, which was their last name. Uh, I think they have one of these little things. That's one of those. Um, is that a Freemason uh, symbol with the the tools? I can't remember which one it is. It's one of those uh, societies, but I can't remember which one it is. But there's her head, uh, her headstone, or her grave. I was able to find it online. I'm guessing that is her husband, Reverend Claude T, and he died what? 28, I don't know, 18 years before she was murdered. Yeah, really pretty lady, right? Even even at 80, she was really, really pretty. Yes, yeah, someone essayed and killed that sweet lady. Yes, unfortunately. Not something we like to uh, ever see on anyone, but yet alone a lady who opened her door to everyone. And they said that may have been one of the problems is that even if it was someone coming for the grandson like that he owed money to, she probably would have opened the door to them because she was that kind of friendly woman. She wouldn't have like just ignored them. She would have opened them up and see what see what they wanted. So maybe that could have been a reason because there was no forced entry in the home. There was a, a sign of a struggle and there was blood found on the door. Uh, but no, no fingerprints, no perpetrator DNA, which is interesting for a stabbing attack. Normally with a stabbing attack, um, the perpetrator often cuts themselves in the act and you will find their DNA, but somehow in this one that did not happen. Seeing if I've got another, there's one, do we have another one of her? No. Let me see if I can find another photo for you. There we go. So 
So that's another photo of her when she was, I think that was closer to her murder. That was a little, there you go. There's a photo when she, I think that must be, yeah, closer to when she was uh, in her 80s. But yeah, she didn't change much through the years. She still looks like her earlier photos. Yeah, see, Emmeline Simpson was her, must be her maiden name, born May 6, uh, 1910 in Athens in uh, McMinn County in Tennessee. So she lived and died in Tennessee for her entire life. Died on December 8, 1990 in Alcoa. She was the daughter of Henry Matthew Simpson and Adeline Wattenbarger. Uh, she first married Claude Etheridge, that was the Claude we see on the headstone, and second married James Croft. Huh, that's interesting. I wonder why she's not married, uh, buried next to her second husband, James Croft, and she's buried, buried next to her original husband, you can see here. Claude T. Yeah, Claude Etheridge was her very first marriage, and she married again to James Croft. That's interesting. Maybe they had a very bad divorce? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Why did she get buried next to her original husband, not her second marriage? I don't have those answers. Uh, it says here, Emmeline is buried in Grandview Cemetery, in Maryville Blunt, Tennessee, in plot number 3410-A2, as Emmeline Croft. It's interesting. So her name is her second husband's last name, but she's buried with her first husband. Okay, that's a bit confusing. <laughs> Maybe the husband already paid for it when he went before he died, possibly. Ah, uh, hey, DJ. Oh, yes, like the company who makes the uh, alum uh, aluminium foil in America, uh, Alcoa, and they make Alcoa steel. I've heard of that. I've heard of that. That's a good, uh, good tip, though. Yeah, maybe before he died, maybe he bought a double plot before he passed away. It could be. Uh, you guys could be right. But it is interesting that she's buried under Croft and not Etheridge. Although it does say Etheridge on the plaque. Yeah, interesting. Oh, maybe that's why Red Like Wine. You could be right. Uh, Red Like Wine says, My parents planned their funerals and paid for the plots when they were in their 50s. Rodney Alcoa, yes. Hey guys, hey Emily Knob, how are you? Marlene Clawson, Retired RN, Marilyn Landis, Lux. Lux says, how can people hurt seniors? I know, right? Sienna's here. Nanalana. Did I miss anyone while I was talking for like 20 minutes? Laura G. Marjorie's here. It's good to see you all. By the way, our copyright issue was fixed this morning. I have updated the ending video with uh, people from the last couple of weeks. I went through everything on the Ko-Fi thing and the other thing. I went through the last however long and I picked up everyone. And uh, that's all fixed now. And we can use the video again. So that is good news. Hey, Laurie. <laughs> Laurie says, my ex better not be buried by me. We will make sure. We'll make sure he won't be. All right. If you want to watch that episode, you can find it on Hulu, YouTube, and the Oxygen app, Oxygen uh, Oxygen TV app, and you can uh, download that, and I think they have something like watch three episodes for free or something, so you should be able to watch it if you are in the continental United States. If you're in Canada, I have no idea. It might be on one of your streaming services. I have no idea for Canada. All right, shall we talk about this or this? Hold on. 
I've got a couple we can move to. Just trying to see which one. By the way, I saw in the paper when I was looking up a different story for tonight. I'm not sure if people saw this in the news. First fatal California mountain lion attack in 20 years leaves one man dead and his brother injured. The mountain lion was dispatched, according to the sheriff's office. I was like, wow, is that true? The first one in 20 years in California? I thought they would have had heaps because there's quite a lot of cougars or mountain lion, uh, especially near the Mexico border. But this was in Northern California, not SoCal. And it's interesting. It happened at near the El Dorado National Forest, 52 miles northeast of Sacramento. Apparently, a teenager survived the attack called 911 at about 1.13 p.m., reporting they'd been attacked by a cougar and that he'd, be, he'd become separated from his older sibling. That's horrible. And then apparently, one man died, one man survived. An additional deputy sent to the scene launched a search for the teenager's brother, finding him nearby lying motionless on the ground with the mountain lion crouched between them and the mortally injured man, according to the sheriff's office. Deputies discharged their firearms in order to scare the mountain lion off so they could render medical aid. By the time they reached the victim, he was dead, according to authorities. Apparently, the teenager was taken to a local hospital where he was being treated. Information on his condition is not immediately disclosed. Apparently, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Game Wardens and an El Dorado County trapper combed the area for the mountain lion. The mountain lion was dispatched and the body of the mountain lion was collected for further examination. It says mountain lion attacks on humans are rare in California. The last recorded fatal mountain lion attack in California occurred in January 2004 when a 35-year-old cyclist was killed on a trail in Orange County. The last fatal mountain lion attack in El Dorado County occurred in April 1994 when a 40-year-old woman was killed in the Auburn State Recreation Area, according to officials. Since, 19, since 1890, Fewer than 50 mountain lion attacks on humans have been reported in California, including six that have been fatal. Wow, there you go. I just came across that when I was looking for a different story earlier, and I thought you would all like to know about that. Okay. We have this story. Suspect in Greenville, Colorado, double homicide found dead in McCormick. It says the Maudlin, uh, Malden Police Department has shared more details regarding a double homicide that occurred Saturday night. Officials received a 911 call around 6 p.m. reporting gunshots coming from the parking lot of the Arbors at Brookfield Apartments on Saturday. It says police, fire, and county EMS, along with investigators from the Greenville County Coroners, responded to the apartment complex on East Butler Road around 6 p.m. At the scene, officials found two women that were dead. <clears throat> it says, upon arrival, Uniform Patrol found, found two what appeared to be deceased females on the scene. Investigation potentially appears to be domestic in nature. One woman was identified as 52-year-old Kim Melissa Thrift of Greenville. The other woman was identified as 41-year-old um, Mary Lynn uh, Besant Minor of Greenville. Police shared that the two were friends. At By 10 p.m. on Saturday, police named Christopher Minor as a suspect in the death and added that Minor is a resident of the apartments. There's a photo. There's a photo. That's a great photo. It looks like he's possessed. It looks like he's some sort of doll. Uh, it says in a Sunday afternoon press conference, police said that Minor and uh, what's her name? Mary... Mary Ellen, sorry, Mary Ellen Minor and Christopher Minor were married but had separated. Mary Ellen and Kim Thrift were at Christopher Minor's apartment complex to pick up children that the couple had shared. A fight then occurred leading to the shooting. Officials shared that Christopher Minor left the scene and that the two children, sorry, and that the children were at the apartment when officials arrived. 
Police said the children are now with other family members. Uh, officials said a park ranger with Baker Creek State Park found Miner's car on Sunday morning. Miner was found dead by Lake Thurmond with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So he shot his his ex-wife and her friend when they came to pick up the children. Huh. Let's watch the news report about it. It'll say it way better than me. So her name is Mary Ellen. There we go. Where police are searching for a man they say killed two women. Officials say they responded to Arbors at Brookfield Apartments yesterday evening and found the two victims. Breaking this morning, the coroner identified one of the women as Kim Thrift. They say she had at least one gunshot wound. Authorities say the suspect, Christopher Minor, is charged with two counts of murder. Investigators tell us they believe this was not a random act. Upon our arrival, Uniform Patrol found two of what appeared to be deceased females uh, on the scene. This is a active double homicide investigation. Uh, potential appears to be domestic in nature. We have several leads and hopefully we'll have a positive result before the end of the night. And Malden police say they believe Miner is driving a white Cadillac with the South Carolina plate 297AFW. So if you see him or you have any information about where he might be, call Malden police. And we will. I think we can find a better video than that. That's an old one, considering they say they've already found him dead. Yeah, officials said a park ranger with Baker Creek. State Park found Miner's car on Sunday morning. Miner was found dead with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So we should be able to... Yeah, let's see if we can find a better one. No. Let's see if we can find something better. Okay, all of them are just like saying they're searching for him. It looks like maybe they haven't done an update as of yet. Yeah, it says Malden police searching for a suspect after two women found dead. But no... Yeah, no like update video saying, you know, like he was found dead at the, at the lake or whatever. Hmm. Okay, we don't get one, but that is very concerning that it seems to be another male taking the life of two females, one his ex-wife and one her friend, who had obviously come along as security for the for the ex-wife. Obviously, the ex-wife felt scared and didn't feel okay dropping the children off or picking them up. And she said, well, I'm going to bring a friend just in case. And this guy ends up killing both of them. I mean... Women aren't even safe if they bring a friend. It's like, that's not even, you know. And now there's another family that's missing their mom or their sister or whatever because of this guy. I've got to find out more about this and how this happened. Let's see if we can find something for you. No, that's not it. I can't seem to find anything like more recent about this. It's not it's not that old, like I mean it's not that new either. Maybe this one. Officers are looking for a suspect after a double murder in Malton. Police rushed to the arbors at Brookfield Apartments at around 6 last night after 911 calls about gunfire in the parking lot. Officers found two women dead. The coroner's office has identified one of these women, saying Kim Melissa Thift of Greenville died at the scene. They're still looking for the other woman's next of kin. They have not identified her yet. Officers say they're looking for a suspect, 50-year-old Christopher Minor. They believe Minor lives at the arbors, but the victims did not. Upon our arrival, Uniform Patrol found two of what appeared to be deceased females uh, on the scene. This is a active double homicide investigation. Uh, potential appears to be domestic in nature.
Miner was last seen driving a white Cadillac with South Carolina plates 297AFW. It's Carolina, not uh, Colorado. Sorry about that. It said CO, but in my mind, being an Australian, I was like, that. that, that is um, Colorado to me, but it's not. It meant county. Greenville County, not Greenville, Colorado. It's actually in, uh, I looked it up. Maudlin County is in South Carolina. At least I'm guessing so. Yes, SC, South Carolina. It looks like there's no detailed coverage, though. It looks like most of them are just these one-minute videos. Hey, you got your jobs here. Believe in Ping. I told you you would get that job. See? Believe in the communal spirit of good vibes of Ping. I told you you were going to get that job. <laughs> yes. Glad you got the job. Well done. Good work. Hey, Shimpy. How are you, my friend? Let me see what you guys are saying up here. LMS says... Um, Maudlin is uh, dangerous, is dangerous. My cousin used to live there. I'm glad they used to live there and they don't live there anymore. Um, Marilyn Landis says DV. It definitely seems like almost just more than DV. It's like domestic violence plus because they killed the friend too. It's awful. Um, home of Murdoch. Yeah, yeah it is. That is true. Uh, let's see. Still think he looks possessed. And why did they only provide like half his face here? They're like, we're looking for this half a head. Can you please help us locate this man who doesn't have a mouth? We'd, we'd like you to locate this man who has just eyes and a nose and some hair. He has no chin. He has no jaw. <laughs> we're looking for this floating head. I'm trying to see if we have anything else on this woman, though. Let's have a look. Um, Kim Melissa Thrift. One woman was identified. The other woman, Mary Ellen Besant Minor. Let's see. WYFF, maybe? No, that's the same one. They're trying to trick us. There's really not a lot of updates. Maybe because it's a weekend. Maybe that's what it is. Okay, this one has a bit more information. It says, A woman who Maudlin Police said was a victim in a double homicide on Saturday night has ties to North Myrtle Beach and is the daughter of a famed Grand, St uh, Grand Strand nightclub owner. Mary Ellen Besant Minor, 41, of Greenville, and her friend Kim Melissa Thrift were reportedly found dead in the parking lot of a Maudlin apartment complex. Her estranged husband, Chris, was found dead by McCormick County Lake on Sunday with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. According to authorities, he was wanted by police in connection with the shootings. Besant's father, affectionately known as Fat Harold, was a co-owner of North Myrtle Beach Nightclub and widely credited with help establishing the shag being named as South Carolina's state dance. Okay. Uh, Harold Besson died in 2015 at the age of 82. His obituary lists Mary Ellen and her husband as survivors. Mary Ellen Besson moved to Greenville in 2012, according to her professional biography on C. Dan Joyner Realtor's website. It says, I am originally from North Myrtle Beach, where the fun in the sun, beach, music, and shag dancing reigned supreme. Like many beach natives, my career began in the service and hospitality industries. My father owned restaurants in North Myrtle, so I was born and raised in the restaurant biz. At a Sunday afternoon press conference, police said that Mary Ellen Minor and Christopher Minor were married but had separated. Well, where is that press conference? And it said Mary Ellen Minor and Thrift were at his apartment complex to pick up the children that the couple shared. A fight then occurred leading to the shooting, according to WSPA. Officials said that Christopher Minor left the scene 
and that the children were at the apartment when authorities arrived. So he shot the mother, shot her friend, left the children there, and then ran away. Okay. Don't... What was he thinking there? I want to see if we can get a police press conference. So apparently police did a press conference, but I can't find it. Maybe it was like one of those ones where it's only to the media. Uh huh. City of Maudlin. Let's see if this works. They just say Christopher Minor has been found deceased at Baker Creek State uh, State Park in McCormick County, SC, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. But there's no press conference. Hmm. I don't know. If I ever find it, I'll give it to you. Appreciate that, Danny. Guys, give me one second. Sorry, I had to close the door so the cats can't get in. I think he must have had the kids and the mum and her friend must have come to the apartment complex to pick up the children after his allotted time. Something happened, a fight broke out and he shot the mum and her friend. So, and then he ran away and left the kids in the apartment with two dead bodies. So you can tell he's a real stand-up father. It's like now he robs the world of the mother and the and the dad. I mean, so his children are going to grow up as orphans. How wonderful. What a great guy. Let me see. Press conference. Hmm. All right. Maybe if we search Twitter. No, just um, just from okay, maybe WSPA might have it. No, just that one we watched before that goes for like a minute. All right, I don't know. I don't know why we're not allowed to have the uh, the press conference. Apparently, we're just not allowed to. They're like, no, you cannot have it. All right, fine. If I get it, if I get it later, I'll put it on tomorrow's show, okay? If I can somehow dig it up, I will do it tomorrow. Now, uh, LMS says, I'm 30 to 45 minutes from South Carolina. Depending where you're going, some areas is beautiful, but 90% is very dangerous. My kids and I will drive an hour and a half to the lake, but that's it. Yeah, so that's who had the kids. All right, let's move on. And if I if I get more, I'll I'll let you know. Uh, unless this one has it, let me have a quick look, and then we'll. Yeah, no, I can't find it. It must have been a private or closed press conference. Yeah. All right. All right, let's do this one. We're going to go to KDSK. What is this called? The news on your side. A two-year-old shoots self with St. Louis deputy's gun. It says police got the call just before 6 p.m. Saturday and responded to the Knowles townhomes off Pershall Road and I-270. It says a two-year-old boy shot himself after getting a hold of a City of St. Louis Sheriff's Department's deputy's gun in Ferguson on Saturday. The toddler is now at a hospital and recovering from an injury to his stomach. The child is believed to be the deputy's nephew. 
Ferguson Police Detective Sammy Newman was there when the call came in and said the two-year-old boy was visiting the deputy when the boy picked up the man's service gun. And he says, children don't understand what guns are capable of, and when they have it within reach, they are often curious, they want to play with it, they want to touch it. Unload your guns and invest in some gun locks, he said. That is, that is good advice. Newman said, just because the suspect is law enforcement doesn't mean he's above the law. He says, I will hold you to a higher standard because you've been through the training. You know the danger that's associated with guns. If you're law enforcement or you're a regular civilian, for every action, there is a reaction and consequences. The Ferguson Police Department is recommending the deputy face charges related to endangering the welfare of a child, which is a misdemeanor. The department is expected to present the case to the city's prosecuting attorney on Thursday. They said, our prayers are with the family of this young man who was tragically injured. We are praying for his complete recovery. The tragic accident is exactly why I mandate weapon safety training and safe storage, including gun locks. Hmm. I mean, he, the kid should never been able to get a hold of it, even if he was visiting his uncle. Hi, Mike Bush. Investigators say the deputy is claiming responsibility and is now facing a criminal charge. Brent Solomon is live outside the sheriff's office with what the sheriff is saying tonight. Brent. Well, Mike, the sheriff says that deputies here go through training so that situations like this don't happen. More from him in a minute. But first, I caught up with the officer who responded to the scene as soon as the call came in that a two-year-old boy shot himself in the stomach. It was just before 6 Saturday evening here at the Knowles Townhomes off Pershall Road and 270. You committed this act and you have to be accountable for it. Ferguson Police Detective Sammy Newman was there when the call came in. He responded, arriving at the St. Louis Sheriff's deputy's home. A two-year-old relative was visiting the deputy when the little boy picked up the man's service gun and shot himself. Children don't understand, you know, what the guns are capable of, right? And when they have it within reach, they they often curious. You know, they want to they go on to play with it. They want to go touch it and load your guns up. Invest in some like gun locks. That's probably especially important if a child is visiting your home. One hundred percent. We reached out to Sheriff Vernon Betts, a spokesperson, sending us a statement saying, "Quote." First, our prayers are with the family of this young man who was tragically injured. We are praying for his complete recovery. This tragic accident is exactly why I mandate weapon safety training and safe storage, including gun locks. Police are seeking a misdemeanor charge of endangering the welfare of a child against that deputy. Newman says just because he's in law enforcement doesn't mean he's above the law. I will hold you to a higher standards because you've been through the training. You know the danger that associated with guns. If you are law enforcement or you're a regular civilian, right? There's for every action there is a reaction and consequences, right? An update now. I'm told that little boy was released from the hospital and is recovering nicely. Meantime, I asked the sheriff here if that deputy will be suspended as a result of this. We're waiting to get that answer. Live in St. Louis tonight, Brent Solomon, five on your It's good to see the uh, the city police actually taking a hardline approach, even if it's one of their own. I mean, uh, he must have felt terrible, but it's still his own weapon. I mean, you have to you have to make sure it's locked up. Let's see what you guys have to say. Laurie says, you never hear anything about the Simpsons kids. I have no idea who that is. You'd have to t you have to give me more details. Marlene Clawson said, the weird thing in the USA is that the last person that dies family usually gets the children, even in murder cases. Well, I hope that's not how it works. I hope it goes to the woman's family in this one. I mean... She was murdered. I mean, I don't know. Oh, O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. Okay, gotcha. I was like, The Simpsons? Like the TV show? I was like, that's weird. All right. 
that's that one. Let me just tidy up my uh, my links for a second. You know, I was looking into more information about the the body parts found in Babylon in New York, but there is no update. There's just nothing. They were released on bail, but no murder charges as of yet. I'll show you, but I find that so strange that they haven't charged anyone with murder, see? One of the suspects arrested in connection with the dismembered body parts found scattered across Long Island was arrested again over the weekend. Amanda Wallace, 40, of Amityville, was rearrested Friday night on a new uh, petite licensee charge after allegedly stealing from a CVS store. All four suspects in the case were released after their arrest as their charges relating to the mutilation and disposable, uh, disposal of murdered corpses are no longer bail eligible in New York State. Wallace, along with Steve Brown, uh, were back in court on Monday. Brown had a court conference which was adjourned. He was released with his GPS monitoring device. But no murder charges? This is very, very interesting, right? I find it weird that they're only on mutilation charges, but they haven't uh, like discovered how that p those two people died because a murder charge would be a bail eligible offense but yeah this are four people that they said did the dismembering and dumping of the body parts across Long Island but yeah no idea so it says here disposal of murdered corpses so if they were murdered who murdered them and why does no one have any murder charges let's see this what this says all right this morning a war of words between governor hochel and the suffolk county district attorney in the case of the dismembered body parts found on long island yeah it all started right here on good day new york yesterday with the governor and maybe the DA should have done a more thorough investigation and brought murder charges or conspiracy to commit murder or even assault charges because all of them are bail eligible. And I think it's uh, irresponsible for people who have no idea what the facts and circumstances of the case are uh, to comment on. And that was Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney yesterday at a press conference, and he's kind enough to join us this morning here on Good Day New York in studio. Thank you for joining us. Again. Thank you. All right, well, first of all, just your response. Well, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, all of the, the sort of back and forth conceals the real issue. The real issue is bail reform and uh, you bail reform has failed and we need to change the law. We could reform it really quickly by allowing prosecutors to be able to argue the dangerousness of the individual as a factor in keeping them in on bail. So the governor said maybe you should have filed different charges. She's a lawyer. You're a lawyer. Explain it to those of us that are lay people. Why did you choose the charges that you chose instead of something that would be not eligible for bail? Sure. Well, you know, first and foremost, we're we're working with our, our partners in the Suffolk County Police Department. We know the facts and circumstances. No one else does at this point because it's an ongoing investigation. But, um, you know, it's not like CSI where everything gets uh, nicely wrapped up in an exactly an hour. So you have a situation about eight days ago, uh, body parts were found in three separate locations. Uh, and you have to put the case together. You have to build the case. You have obviously blood, DNA, cell site, uh, social media, uh, phone evidence, and you need to synthesize that and put that all together. Now, that takes a while. But what we did have is we, we did have a probable cause to charge the, the three cases of uh, the three charges. We, we charged them, uh, but unfortunately, because of bail reform, notwithstanding the, the dangerousness of the situation, we weren't able to keep All right, so bail. can you, uh, it's legalese gobbledygook to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> what did these three people, what are they accused of doing? So they're did, not murder, right? Yes, they're, they're accused of uh, dismembering the cor corpses. So chopping up people who were already murdered? Uh, chopping up a corpse, which is a you know, dead person, yes. And concealing it. And concealing it and for the purposes of hindering the prosecution of the underlying murder. And they're out with a, a monitor on around the ankle monitor. Correct. Do those ankle monitors work? They do. Really? Yeah. But, I mean, obviously... Did she just ask, do ankle monitors work? No, they're filled with friggin' 
Pez candy and they just rattle when people walk and we're like, hey, they're coming. No, of course they work. What do you mean do they work? They're, they're like your phone, they're GPS. What do you mean they work? <laughs> That's a weird question. Do they work? No, they're just, uh, you know, full of candy. Uh, that was a weird question. Okay, so basically they're saying that they haven't been able to build their case yet for a murder charge. And these charges of mutilation and whatever, they're holding charges while they process the other the other uh, evidence and build the case. And How I put it or they put it? I know, I think they're by... Yeah, I know, right? Do they work? It's a bit weird. It's like, yes, they're they're like having a phone strapped to your ankle. Of course they work. <laughs> Laurie G says she makes a box of rocks look smart. All right. Yeah, I know there's there's of course there's mistakes. Um there've been cases where ankle monitors were not hooked up. Yeah, they weren't registered to the uh, provider, yeah. Oh, yeah, that is a bit of... Um, I know, the respect for the victims was not very high in that video. I find that a bit annoying. But uh, we'll see, because it's almost like they charge them with the end result, but not the first part of how the bodies got to Long Island, if you know what I mean. They charge him with the dumping and the mutilation, but not the first part of actually killing them. So it's like they're starting from the end and working backwards. And I guess that's what we're going to have to wait on. Wait for them to build their brief of evidence, and then hopefully they'll charge them with murder because they didn't chop themselves up and, you know, murder themselves and scatter themselves across Long Island. So... I mean, someone has to be held accountable. New Yorkers are pretty blunt. Yes, that is true. Okay, what time is it? Have I been prattling on for long enough? Uh, it's one seventeen. Okay. Let's keep going. I don't have anything on any Aussie cases right now. Uh, maybe tomorrow. I Oh, actually I do. The brief of evidence for um, Aaron Patterson was handed up a couple of days early on Thursday. They, the police, have handed that up now. We will come back in May. We will come back in May, and uh, in May we should actually get a very good summary of what those charges entail and what the police case is against Aaron Patterson. It'll be the first time we get a look into how the police think she did this, and possibly a motive, we will see. Um, so about a month away, it'll be a big day for uh, the Aaron Patterson uh, case. Be the biggest one so far. Yeah, we should actually get to know a little bit about what the police know. So that'll be very interesting. All right. While I was off the air, we missed... A person called Skylar Mead, white supremacist and accomplice recaptured after U.S. prison breakout. We missed a breakout. We missed uh, people escaping from prison. And it says, three correctional officers were shot, two by a suspect and one by a responding police during a brazen overnight attack to break Skylar Mead out of an Idaho hospital. It says, police have arrested an Idaho prison inmate and the accomplice who helped him escape with investigators looking into whether they killed two people while on the run. It says, two white supremacist gang members were arrested on Thursday following an attack on corrections officers at the Boise Hospital. Skylar Mead, the escaped inmate, and Nicholas uh, uh, Umfenor, the man who police say shot two Idaho corrections officers early on Wednesday to break Mead out of custody were arrested after a brief car chase on Thursday afternoon in Twin Falls, about 130 miles from the hospital. Authorities said they were investigating two homicides in Clearwater County and Nez Perce County 
which borders Washington State. Both victims were men. Police found shackles at the scene of one of the killings, and that's one of the ways we tied them together, Idaho State Police Lieutenant Colonel Sheldon Kelly said. Meade, 31, was sentenced to 20 years in prison in 2017 for shooting at a sheriff's sergeant during a high-speed chase. Uh, Umfanor was released from the same prison, the Idaho Maximum Security Institution in Kuna, south of Boise, in January. The two had at times been housed together, were both members of the Aryan Knights prison gang, and had mutual friends inside and out of prison, according to officials. No shots were fired during the arrest, police said. The attack on the Idaho officers just came after 2 a.m. on Wednesday in the ambulance bay of uh, St. Alphonus Regional Medical Center as they were preparing to return Meade to the prison. He had been brought to hospital earlier in the night because he injured himself. After the ambush, one of the officers was shot by Umfanor and was in critical but stable condition while the second wounded officer had serious but non-life-threatening injuries. I have to play a video of this because I want to know if I'm pronouncing that guy's name right. Hold on. That's what it sounds like to me in my head, but we'll see. It was a couple of days ago and somehow we didn't we didn't catch on to a massive inmate search. Alright, let's go to W R W R A L with a press conference. Let's have a look. They are dangerous, they are armed, and they have shown a propensity for violence. Boise, Idaho's police chief is talking about these two men, escaped inmate Skylar Mead and his alleged accomplice, Nicholas Umpenauer. Both are on the run after what police called a coordinated attack on corrections officers early Wednesday morning. As Mead was being prepared for transport back to prison from Boise's St. Alphonsus Hospital, a man appeared with a gun. Suspect attacked and fired at the officers striking two of them. That suspect was later identified as Umfenauer, who police say then fled with Meade in a gray Honda Civic sedan. Prison officials say Meade is serving 20 years for aggravated battery on a law enforcement officer. He's considered extremely dangerous, housed in the prison's most restricted area, known as administrative segregation. He's also known to have ties to a white supremacist gang. He has tattoos on his face, uh, the number one on one side of his face and the number 11 on the other side. Numbers that correspond with letters of the alphabet. The one and 11 refer to AK or Aryan Knights. Now Umpenauer is accused of aggravated battery against law enforcement and aiding and abetting an escape, according to police. We want to make sure that any member of the public who happens to come in contact with them is aware of that and that you do not try to intervene. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. And Mr. Mead, I believe we have provided photographs and updated photographs of him. Here is Boise Police Chief Ron Weiniger showing recent photos of Skylar Mead, the man who escaped IDOC custody while at St. Alphonsus. Here he is photographed just last month. Mead was taken to St. Alphonsus after hurting himself bad enough he needed emergency care. IDOC Director Josh Tewalt said in high-risk medical transports like these, there are two unarmed staff members as well as an armed chase car. Each unarmed staff member uh, helps escort on one side of the individual while you have an armed staff member that trails behind to, to keep watch. T. Walt says all those employees were in uniform, black and tan attire with a ballistic vest. Meade was nearly eight years into a 20-year sentence. His list of charges is long. For aggravated battery on a law enforcement officer with a firearm enhancement, and he has many prior convictions, including felony possession of controlled substance, grand theft, and introduction of contraband into a correctional facility. Chief Weiniger referenced Meade's appearance multiple times, calling it distinct. The number one on one side of his face and the number 11 on the other side. He is a documented gang member and with the Aryan Knights. The Aryan Knights are a white supremacist Idaho prison gang, according to the Department of Justice. T. Walt says Meade was dangerous in jail too, housed in administrative segregation, and he was charged with bringing contraband into the correctional facility both in 2016 and in 2019. There's not a higher custody level that we manage at the Department of Correction. That's not a, a classification that is, that is determined by your criminal history. It's a classification that's earned by your behavior while in custody.
All right, there you go. At least they got them back, and now they're back in prison. Maria says, unless you have your own business long-term and get awesome tattoos on one's face can look cool. I guess. Depends what you do. Are you a millionaire rapper? Are you a millionaire NFL player or basketball player? Then you can do what you like. You'll never need to earn money again. Yeah, you have to do anything else? Well, it's a risk. Um, It says here, Major update for alleged stepdad killer of schoolgirl Charlize Martin, 9, found dumped in barrel in the bush as new details are revealed. A man who allegedly murdered his 9-year-old stepdaughter and dumped her body in a barrel in the bush will face trial later this year. Justin Stein, 32, appeared in the New South Wales Supreme Court via audiovisual link on Monday as he prepares to stand trial over the allegations. He is accused of murdering Charlize Martin, the daughter of his fiance, while on a family holiday in the New South Wales Blue Mountains and dumping her body in a plastic barrel. The school schoolgirl's body was discovered with alleged gunshot wounds in bushland near Colo River in the New South Wales Central Tablelands in January 2022. Mr. Stein has denied murdering the nine-year-old after he was left alone with her on January 11th. We have spoken about this before when it happened. There's a photo of Justin, uh, child killer or alleged. Oh, I can't say that. It's not an American case. It's an Australian case. Uh, alleged, possibly, somewhat, could be, depending on the trial and the jury and the evidence, possibly. There we go. On Monday, Justin Helen Wilson confirmed that Mr. Stein would face a seven-week trial in the New South Wales Supreme Court at Parramatta on May 6. Prosecutor Ken McKay, SC, said Crown would seek to rely on evidence of websites Mr. Stein had access in the lead-up to January 12 when Charlie's disappeared. He also foreshadowed an application for the judge to visit the house in Mount Wilson where Mr. Stein allegedly killed her. We hope to have that done in the next three weeks, he said. Justin Wil- uh, Justice Wilson noted there would be a seasonal variations in the landscape because the scene would be viewed in autumn when the schoolgirl was allegedly killed in January. We can consider this when we get to it, she said. Mr. Stein was staying at a family at his family's property at Mount Wilson in January 2022 with his fiance Callista Mutton and her daughter Charlize when the schoolgirl vanished. Prosecutors allege Mr. Stein murdered the nine-year-old on either the evening of January 11th or in the early hours of January 12th when the pair were alone together. Here's a photo of the murdered nine-year-old girl. Here's another photo of her. He said he allegedly then travelled from Mount Wilson to Sydney's northwest and inner west before returning to the Kola River near the Hawkesbury where he disposed of her body. Charlie's was declared missing on January 14th, triggering a lengthy multi-agency search of surrounding bushlands involving hundreds of volunteers. Her body was found four days later inside a barrel in the bushland, and Mr. Stein was arrested. He has remained behind bars on remand for two years as he awaits trial. So we're going to trial with this one in the hopefully to get justice for this little girl. That would be good. I don't know, does drought contribute to art? Maybe. Tina says, at least one always knows where you stand with the New Yorker. That's the way I prefer it. Fair enough. Uh, But this is a good update. We're finally getting to trial. And um, yeah, what 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 a cute little girl. Can't believe she had to endure her final moments that she did. How horrible. I'm I'm also guessing, unfortunately, there may be some uh, like child abuse of the sexual nature there, unfortunately. I don't think you just shoot a young girl twice in the head for no reason. I think there's possibly some abuse he was trying to cover up. Maybe she said she was going to tell her mom or something and he had to make her disappear. So this guy is a complete scumbag. And uh, we'll see what happens when he goes to trial. 
a bit later this year. When did they say he's going to go to trial? Just later this year. Okay. On May 6th, so only a month away. Only about a month away, we're going to get to go to the trial for this one. It's on the same day that we should get the information about Erin Patterson and her trial. So this is pretty quick. Maybe they normally like to do it like nine months later, but we'll see. Maybe we'll get a quick trial for Erin Patterson as well. I mean, that's a fast day, only a month away for this one. Hmm. I'd like to, I'd like that for Aaron Patterson, so we don't have to wait till next year. Yes, definitely SA. Yes, another very sad child story. Yes, I agree. Beauty for Ashes, very sad. All right, let me see if we've got anything else for the night, and then we'll be back on the week. I mean. We've got a, a long week. We've got Good Friday on Friday. And then we've got the next four days to cover stuff before the Easter break. We're going to have a great week together starting tomorrow. Sunday nights are always a bit of a quiet night, but that's okay. Monday will be bonkers like it always is because all the news comes out and all the updates and it'll be a crazy Monday. Hmm, let me see. Let me check on these uh these storms. Did we get more tornadoes like people are saying? Let's have a look. Don't think so. No. There hasn't been one reported for a, a few hours now. So it looks like you are safe. But there is a risk for tomorrow, apparently. A larger risk for tomorrow? Yeah, actually, tomorrow could be a big day for Louisiana. Yes, Louisiana and Mississippi. Tomorrow, uh, keep your... Uh, wits about you if you are in Louis, LA or MS. That's a 10% hatched risk. That is pretty pretty high in um, tornado terms. I mean, we, we normally see stuff like 15, 20, 25, but a 10% day is pretty devastating. Can get some pretty big tornadoes, especially in this area in the south. You can get some uh, low-lying very wide tornadoes with a low cloud base and they can't be seen because there's so many trees in this area that you never see them until they're right on top of you it's not like you can see them a mile away like you can in uh texas or oklahoma kansas nebraska down in this area you can't see them until they're about a street away so be very careful if you're in um in this hatched risk zone and in the 5% and the 2%. Keep your severe weather plan handy tomorrow. It could be a, a dangerous day. What does it say here? Enhanced risk throughout the portions of the lower Mississippi Valley. A few tornadoes and damaging wind are possible. Monday through Monday night from parts of East Texas through the lower Mississippi Valley. There you go. And then it says Mid-South into Lower MS Valley. And then Western Iowa and Far Northwest Missouri. Okay. There you go. Be careful. All right, let me get a, an actual crime thing. Oh, here. Yeah. I did see this update, unfortunately. Uh, Riley Strain's death appears accidental, Metro Police say. A Missouri family is heartbroken after learning the fate of 22-year-old Riley Strain following a nearly two-week search effort in Nashville. 
The Mizu Senior's body was found in the Cumberland River in West Nashville on Friday, roughly eight miles away from where, where he was last seen in downtown on March 8. On Saturday, March 23rd, the, Ma- the Metro Nashville Police Department confirmed to News 2 that Strain's preliminary autopsy had been completed, adding that his death continued to appear accidental with no foul play related trauma. Strain's family traveled from Missouri to Nashville after finding out on March 9 that he went missing, and they remained in town for the duration of the two week search. Yeah, that's a very sad update. It definitely looks like when he was puking over the edge, uh, he may have slipped and fallen in. And uh, it sounds like they are saying it was an accidental drowning. Very, very sad news. Let's see what this says. Leaving Tennessee heartbroken after coming to the Midstate two weeks ago with one goal in mind, bringing 22-year-old Mizzou senior Riley Strain home. I just ask that you mama's out there hug your babies tight tonight, please. But his fraternity spring formal ended in a way they never expected. Somehow a walk from Broadway took a terrible turn. Riley appearing to struggle, then seemingly coherent in front of a Nashville officer. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Good. Fifteen days later, in countless search hours, Riley would be found in the Cumberland River in West Nashville. But his parents never gave up hope. Riley's captured the hearts of people across the country. And uh, we thank everybody for their thoughts and prayers and their efforts. I'm trying to find him. Although their trip ended in tragedy, Riley's family did get a taste of the volunteer spirit from TikTokers who helped find Riley's debit card. And I just need them to know that there is people who do care as much as they do and even about Riley and about them themselves. To those who traveled hundreds of miles to help safely coordinate volunteer efforts. You know, I've lost a daughter myself. Uh, several years ago and it just it shatters your heart especially when you can feel what that that uh, family is is feeling. David Flagg with the United Cajun Navy is thanking the dozens of volunteers who donated their time boats and canines some driving all the way from Illinois and South Carolina to help bring closure to Riley's family. When you hear a mama just wailing at the top of her lungs because she just lost her baby it it just crushes you, but I think I think they'll be fine. Uh, they are very, very strong in their Christian faith, um, and they know that uh, they know where Riley is, and they know that they'll see him again someday in glory. A message volunteers hope will carry Riley's family home. Yeah, at least they get to take him home. That's all I can say. Yeah, it's what they call the university, right, DJ? They call it Mizu instead of Missouri. I don't know why, but probably just because they like to do slang words. Uh, but yes, I know that through uh, the NCAA, and that's what they call the team. Uh, yeah, very sad. At least they know where he is. At least they can take him home. There's a lot of other families that have people go missing that don't get that, uh, you know, opportunity. Their loved ones stay missing forever. So if there's any small silver lining, it's that they they can go home with him and they can take him back to Missouri. So it's, it's the only small piece of, of uh, you know, silver lining. Um, Evil Alaska says, maybe mom put Sebastian in the gar- garage for punishment, hypothermia. You know, actually, I had an interesting story to tell you something about hypothermia. About three weeks ago, there was a music festival on in Melbourne here. It was 40 degrees out here, right? Uh, there was 23 people who were admitted into hospital for hypothermia after there was a light sprinkle of rain uh, in the evening at the concert. And 23, it was 23 or 25 people admitted for hypothermia. And uh, it just shows you, you don't need a lot, you just need the right circumstances.
for hypothermia to happen. You know, there's apparently you can even get hypothermia in desert. So it's a bit of a funny thing. You just need the right the right ingredients, a little bit of rain. You need to have been really hot and then it needs to feel colder than it is and it it uh you know, it can happen. Yeah, like families like Daniel Robinson still not found. They don't know any more details. Um uh, like that kid who went missing uh Dylan Rounds. Dylan Rounds, they don't know where he is either. So if there's a tiny bit of you know good news for the families that they can travel home with Riley and um lay him to rest at, at home. So as sad as it is, as horrible as that news is, there is that part of it at least. All right. I think that's almost it for the night, guys. I think we're almost done. We've done an hour and 40, almost an hour and 50 minutes. Uh, unless there's anything else people want to want me to bring up or want me to talk about, we can do that. We've done a lot tonight. We've done cold justice. We've done cougars. We've done storms. I told you how I got stuck on the side of the road <laughs> at like 11 o'clock at night on Saturday. Oh my God, that was awful. Um, we've done murders. We did a a stupid guy who murdered his ex-wife and her friend, which is, um, I'll look for the police press conference for that. Maybe we can watch that tomorrow. I just can't seem to find it. Um, let me see. Oh, I want to see this. Hold on. What does this say? It says, man... Well, it's a controversial debate. Hey. It says, man seen swimming with a shark behind him. It says, startling footage has been captured the moment families were sent fleeing a popular Queensland swimming spot after a shark fin was spotted in the water. The clip posted to a Maruchidor Instagram account on Sunday captured the drama unfolding as beachgoers exited the water at popular Cotton Tree Beach. I used to live in Maruchidor. Um, I know this area quite well. Locals were seen standing on the shore watching the shark swim out to sea via the Maruchi River when attention quickly turned to a man seen floating only meters behind the shark, seemingly unfazed by the close encounter. All right, let's see. Let's see if we can find the shark. All right, where's the shark? Oh, there he is. You can see the shark, shark fin. It's probably someone with a plastic shark fin under the water. This dude just hanging out. There's like a 15 foot shark and he's just like, yeah, I swim with sharks. So this is actually, this is actually a channel. Uh, it says Taxman just cruising. In Australia, they're called Taxman the shark because the sharks come and eat your fish. You might have also heard. They'll actually come and eat this your... Probably... Uh, if you catch a fish on a line, they'll actually come and bite the fish, and they call it the tax man because it eats all the fish. Uh, yeah, there you go. Bit of Australian slang for you. There you go. There's the shark fin, and there's a dude just hanging out. Well, it's a. We always like to see crazy people. There is a crazy person. Don't swim with sharks. Yeah, just like Jaws. Yeah. I don't know. Evil Alaska. I, I'm not going to read all that. Yeah, maybe I know that the Cajun Navy is now with the um, searching for Sebastian. Hey, hopefully they'll get, you know, they just helped with um, Riley and they got a result there. Maybe they'll get a result with Sebastian too. That would be, I, I did hear some stuff on the weekend, something about there was a volunteer search dog that hit on a location and the police didn't want to come out and look at it. They just weren't concerned and that they found some sort of bloodied tape or bloodied bandages or something um that was going around twitter 
I can't confirm any of that. It's just what I saw on on the interwebs. So yeah, so I'm not. I don't know how how true it is, or I'll, I'll look it up. But uh, it seems like the Sebastian Rogers case is turning very much into the uh, the Summer Wells case. Why is it always cases from that area? Um, it seems to be going around in in circles right now. It's it's uh, turning into crazy talk. Everyone's like, there's not a lot of information, so they're they're just making stuff up, or you know, it's getting into sort of like a information drain, and everyone's just throwing stuff into it, and it's becoming very muddy, you know, because we're not getting a lot of good information. Not Hendersonville, like Tennessee in general. Right, there has to be, yeah, exactly. I don't think they do stuff on such expensive scales for no reason. They're not like, yeah, hey, other cop, do you want to go hang out in a garbage tip for eight hours? Yeah, man, I love hanging out in garbage tips and smelling like crap when I go home. All right, high five. No, they don't. They don't want to do that. <laughs> they don't want to have to go to the garbage tip for no reason. So, we'll see. I did hear that earlier today. That that um, Chris is driving the camper and Katie's driving a car behind him, and they have left and gone somewhere. I don't know what that means or where they're going, but I did hear that they had left their property because of the stress or something of um speculation around Sebastian's case or something no landfill yes no landfill uh yeah that's all I know I don't other than that there's really not a lot left in the not a lot of good information right now maybe tomorrow being it's Monday we may get a bunch more tomorrow which would be good hopefully we get a good update um I think that's it I think we it was nice to come back. It was good to come back uh, after a night off and get another show done. And uh, we've got a busy week ahead of us. We've got like another six shows in the next week. It's going to be a busy week. And uh, I hope you'll all be here for it. I really do. I appreciate all the comments. We've been busy making new thumbnails. We've got a whole heap of new towns now. So keep an eye out over the next couple of months your town may be our thumbnail one day one day of the week so keep an eye out uh gray hughes did a video about searching telegram app for a user's phone number and it thing you can also do it with um with cash app and then you can see if there's been any payments you can do them with a few different apps um you can also do, yeah, because Telegram requires a phone number if you use it on the app on your phone. They require you to send a code to your phone. So you, people often use telephone numbers as a way of using, uh, like connecting with each other on Telegram. Sort of like WhatsApp. You have a number and you give it to someone else and you connect that way through WhatsApp. Very similar. It's very kind of you to say, Moonlight View. But yes, we will be back tomorrow, okay? Tomorrow, 9 p.m. And tomorrow night, we will have, because uh, it's a Monday, we'll have two shows. We'll have the 9 p.m. show. Then we'll have the late show at midnight. So make sure you tune in then. I want to thank all the people who support the channel, all the new subscribers. You are great. And the people who donate to this channel. Thank you very much. And I hope you see your name on the new video. I'm so glad we're able to do that again now because it was about a week where we didn't have it. So, good night, Beauty for Ashes. Yeah, we will do Lexington, Kentucky soon, I promise. I, I have seen that in my uh, screenshot folder thing. So, we'll do uh, Lexington very soon. We've got heaps. We've got Sydney, Darwin, some in Europe, the UK, Canada, um california there's some in texas uh nebraska there's all over the place 
hundreds of towns and we're busy making them so <laughs> you'll see it soon i'll do some more it stuff tomorrow night okay evil alaska tune in tomorrow night and we'll talk more um investigative it and i'll i'll, I'll show you a few tricks from the networking side of it okay peace out everyone love you all have a great monday morning okay good night everyone